john see how far anti-slavery documents had influence on the slaves themselves it is difficult to say they could neither read nor write but it is remarkable that from this period a large number of slaves made their escape from the south and fled to the north protected by philanthropists abolitionists and kind-hearted people generally how they contrived to travel a thousand miles without money without suitable clothing pursued by bloodhounds and hellhounds hiding in the daytime in swamps morasses and forests walking by night in darkness and gloom until passed by friendly hands through underground railroads until they reached canada is a mystery but these efforts to escape from their hard and cruel masters further intensified the exasperation of the south it was in eighteen thirty six that michigan and arkansas applied for admission as states into the union one free and the other with slavery discussions on some technicalities concerning the conditions of michigan's admission gave mr calhoun a chance for more argumentation about the sovereignty of a state which considering the fact that michigan had not then been admitted but was awaiting the permission of congress to be a state showed the weakness of his logic in the falsity of his premise besides arkansas the slave power also gained access to a strip of free territory north of the compromise line of thirty six degrees thirty minutes and the missouri river in eighteen thirty seven john quincy adams the old man eloquent of the house of representatives narrowly escaped censure for introducing a petition from slaves in the district of columbia in eighteen thirty eight calhoun introduced resolutions declaring that petitions relative to slavery in the district were a direct and dangerous attack on the institutions of all the slaveholding states in eighteen thirty nine henry clay offered a position for the repression of all agitation respecting slavery in the district calhoun saw and constantly denounced the danger he knew the power of public opinion and saw the rising tide conservatism heeded the warning and the opposition to agitation intensified all over the south and the north but to no avail new societies were formed new papers were established religious bodies began to take position for and against the agitation the main legislature passed in the lower house and almost in the upper resolutions denouncing slavery in the district while the abolitionists labored incessantly and vigorously to blow the trumpet cry aloud and spare not show my people their sins as to slavery in eighteen forty van buren and harrison the democratic and whig candidates for the presidency were both in the hands of the slave power and tyler who as vice president succeeded to the executive chair on harrison's death was a virginian slaveholder the ruling classes and politicians all over the land were violently opposed to the anti-slavery cause and every test of strength gave new securities and pledges to the southern elements and their northern sympathizers notwithstanding the frequent triumphs of the south aided by whigs and democrats from the north who played into the hands of southern politicians mr calhoun was not entirely at rest in his mind he saw with alarm the increasing immigration into the western states which threatened to disturb the balance of power which the south had ever held and with the aid of southern leaders he now devised a new and bold scheme which was to annex texas to the united states and thus enlarge enormously the area of slavery it was probably his design not so much to strengthen the slaveholding interests of south carolina as to increase the political power of the south by the addition of new slave states he could hope for more favorable legislation in congress the arch conspirator the haughty and defiant dictator would not only exclude congress from all legislation over its own territory in the national district but he now would make congress bolster up his cause he would calculate on a solid south and also upon the aid of the leaders of the political parties at the north northern men with southern principles who were strangely indifferent to the extension of slavery the abolitionists were indeed now a power but the anti-slavery sentiment had not reached its culmination although it had become politically organized for the campaign of eighteen forty seeing the futility of petition and the folly of expecting action on issues foreign to those on which congressmen had been elected the abolitionists boldly called a national convention in which six states were represented and nominated candidates for the presidency and vice presidency it was a small and despised beginning but it was the germ of a mighty growth 
from that time the liberty party began to hold state and national conventions and to vote directly on the question of representatives they did not for years elect anybody but they defeated many an ultra pro-slavery man and their influence began to be felt in 1841 joshua r giddings from ohio and in 1843 john p hale from new hampshire and hannibal hamlin from maine brought in fresh northern air and confronted the slave power in congress in alliance with grand old john quincy adams whose last years were his best years and have illumined his name most of the anti-slavery men were still denounced as fanatics meddling with what was none of their business in eighteen forty three they had not enrolled in their ranks the most influential men in the community ministers professors lawyers and merchants generally still held aloof from the controversy and were either hostile or indifferent to it so with the aid of the doe faces as they were stigmatized by the progressive party calhoun was confident of success in the texan scheme at that time many adventurers had settled in texas which was then a province of mexico and carried with them their slaves in eighteen twenty moses austin a connecticut man long resident in missouri obtained large grants of land in texas from the mexican government and his son stephen carried out after the father's death a scheme of colonization of some three hundred families from missouri and louisiana they were a rough and lawless population but self-reliant and enterprising they increased rapidly until in eighteen thirty three being twenty thousand in number they tried to form a state government under mexico and this being denied them declared their independence and made revolution they were headed by sam houston who had fought under general jackson and had been governor of tennessee in eighteen thirty six the independence of texas was proclaimed soon after followed the battle of san jacinto in which santa ana the president of the mexican republic and the commander of the mexican forces was taken prisoner immediately after this battle mr calhoun tried to have it announced as the policy of the government to recognize the independence of texas when tyler became president by the death of harrison although elected by whig votes he entered heart and soul into the schemes of calhoun who to forward them left the senate and became secretary of state as successor to mr upshur in eighteen forty three it became apparent that texas would be annexed to the united states in that same year iowa and florida one free the other slave were admitted to the union the liberty party beheld the proposed annexation of texas with alarm and sturdily opposed it as far as they could through their friends in congress predicting that it would be tantamount to a war with mexico the mexican minister declared the same result but texas or disunion became the rallying cry of the south the election of polk the annexationist democrat in eighteen forty four was seized upon as popular mandate for annexation although had not the liberty party who like the whigs were anti-annexationists divided the vote in new york state clay would have been elected the matter was hurried through congress the northern democrats made no serious opposition since they saw in this annexation a vast accession of territory around the gulf of mexico of indefinite extent thus texas on march first eighteen forty five was offered annexation by a joint resolution of the senate and house of representatives in the face of protests from the wisest men of the country and in spite of certain hostilities with mexico on the following fourth of july texas accepting annexation was admitted to the union as a slave state to the dismay of channing of garrison of phillips of sumner of adams and of the whole anti-slavery party now aroused to the necessity of more united effort in view of this great victory to the south for it was provided that at any time by the consent of its own citizens texas might be divided into four states whenever its population should be large enough its territory was four times as large as france the democratic president polk took office in march eighteen forty five the mexican war beginning in may eighteen forty six was fought to a successful close in a year and five months ending in september eighteen forty seven the fertile territory of oregon purchased from spain had been peaceably occupied by rapid immigration and by settlement of disputed boundaries with great britain california a mexican province had been secured to the american settlers of its lovely hills and valleys by the prompt daring of captain john c fremont 
and the result of the war was the formal cession to the united states by mexico of the territories of california and new mexico and recognition of the annexation and statehood of texas both the north and the south had thus gained large possibilities and at the north the spirit of enterprise and the clear perception of the economic value of free labor as against slave labor were working mightily to help men see the moral arguments of the anti-slavery people the division of interest was becoming plain the forces of good sense and the principles of liberty were consolidating the north against farther extension of the slave power the perils foreseen by calhoun which he had striven to avoid by repression of all political discussion of slavery were nigh at hand the politicians of the north too scented the change and began to range themselves with their section and while there was a long struggle yet ahead before the issues would be made up to the eye of faith the end was already in sight and the free soilers now redoubled their efforts both in discussion and in political action thus far most of the political victories had been with the slave power and the south became correspondently arrogant and defiant the war of ideas against southern interests now raged with ominous and increasing force in all the northern states public opinion became more and more inflamed passions became excited in cities and towns and villages which had been dormant since the constitution had been adopted the decree of the north went forth that there should be no more accession of slave territory and more than this the population spread with unexampled rapidity toward the pacific ocean in consequence of the discovery of gold in california in eighteen forty eight and attracted by the fertile soil of oregon immigrants from all nations came to seek their fortunes in territories north of thirty six degrees thirty minutes what calhoun had anticipated in eighteen thirty six when he cast his eyes on texas did not take place slave territory indeed was increased but free territory increased still more rapidly the north was becoming richer and richer and the south scarcely held its own the balance which he thought would be in favor of the south he now saw inclining to the north northern states became more numerous than southern ones and more populous more wealthy and more intelligent the political power of the union when mr polk closed his inglorious administration was perceptibly with the north and not political power only but moral power the great west was the soil of free men but the haughty and defiant spirit of calhoun was not broken he prophesied woes he became sad and dejected but more and more uncompromising more and more dictatorial he would not yield if we yield an inch said he we are lost the slightest concession in his eyes would be fatal when he declared his nullification doctrines it was because he thought that state rights were invaded by hostile tariffs but after the mexican war slavery was to him a matter of life and death he made many excellent and powerful speeches which tasked the intellect of webster to refute but whatever the subject it was seen only through his southern spectacles and argued from partisan grounds and with partisan zeal everything he uttered was with a view of consolidating the south and preparing it for disunion and secession as the only way to preserve the beloved institution in his eyes slavery and the union could not coexist this he saw plainly but if either must perish it should be the union and this doctrine he so constantly reiterated that he won over to it nearly the entire south but in consolidating the south he also consolidated the north he forced on the issue believing that even yet the south united with northern allies was the stronger and that it could establish its independence on a slavery basis the union was no union at all and its constitution was a worthless parchment he proposed a convention of the southern states which should agree that until full justice was rendered to the south all the southern ports should be closed to the sea-going vessels of the north he arrogantly would deprive the north even of its constitutional rights in reference to the exclusion of slavery from the territories in no way should the north meddle with the slavery question on penalty of secession and the sooner this was understood the better we are said he relatively stronger than we shall be hereafter politically and morally the great fight arose in eighteen forty nine the people in the northwestern territories had been encouraged to form governments and had already tasted the delights of self-rule president polk had recommended the extension of the old missouri compromise line of thirty six degrees thirty inches westward to the pacific leaving the territory south of that open to slavery this would divide california and was opposed by all parties calhoun now went so far as to claim the constitutional right to take slaves into any territory 
while webster argued the power of congress to rule the territories until they should become states so excited was the discussion that a convention of southern states was held to frame a separate government for the united states south the threat of secession was ever their most potent argument the contest in congress centered upon the admission of california as a state and the condition of slavery in the territories of utah and new mexico a great crisis had now arrived clay the great pacificator once more stepped into the arena with a new compromise to provide for concessions on either side he proposed the admission of california whose new constitution prohibited slavery the organization of utah and new mexico as territories without mention of slavery leaving it to the people the arrangement of the boundary of texas the abolition of slavery in the district of columbia and the enactment of a more stringent fugitive slave law commanding the assistance of people in the free states to capture runaways when summoned by the authorities the general excitement over the discussion of this bill will never be forgotten by those who witnessed it the south raged and the north blazed with indignation especially over the fugitive slave bill meanwhile calhoun was dying his figure was bent his voice was feeble his face was haggard but his superb intellect still retained its vigor to the last among the multitude of ringing appeals to the reason and moral sense of the north was a newspaper article from the independent of new york by a young congregational minister henry ward beecher it was entitled shall we compromise and made clear and plain the issue before the people slavery is right slavery is wrong slavery shall live slavery shall die are these the conflicts to be settled by any mode of parceling out certain territories this article was read to calhoun upon his dying bed who wrote that he asked the name was given him that man understands the thing he has gone to the bottom of it he will be heard from again it was what the great southerner had foreseen and foretold from the first the compromise bill at last became a law it averted the final outbreak for ten years longer but contained elements that were to be potent factors in ensuring the final crisis with the burden of the whole south upon his shoulders calhoun tottered to the grave a most unhappy man for though he saw the irrepressible conflict as clearly as seward had done he also saw that the south even if successful as he hoped must go through a sea of tribulation when he was no longer able to address the senate in person he still waged the battle his last great speech was read to the senate by mr mason of virginia on the fourth of march eighteen fifty it was not bitter nor acrimonious it was a doleful lament that the southern states could not long remain in the union with any dignity now that the equilibrium was destroyed he felt that he had failed but also that he had done his duty and this was his only consolation in view of approaching disasters on the last day of march he died leaving behind him his principles so full of danger and sophistries but at the same time an unsullied name and the memory of earlier public services and of private virtues which had secured him the respect of all who knew him in reviewing the career of mr calhoun it would seem that the great error and mistake of his life was his disloyalty to the union when he advocated state rights as paramount over those of general government he merely took the ground which was discussed over and over again at the formation of the constitution and which resulted in a compromise that with control over matters of interest common to all states the central government should have no power over the institution of slavery which was a domestic affair in the southern states only these states it was settled had supreme control over their own peculiar institution as a politician representing southern interests he cannot be severely condemned for his fear and anger over the discussion of the slavery question which politically considered was out of the range of congressional legislation or popular agitation but when he advocated or threatened the secession of the southern states from the union unless the slavery question was let alone entirely both by congress and the northern states he was unpatriotic false in his allegiance and unconstitutional in his utterances a state has a right to enter the union or not remaining of course in either case united states territory over which congress has legislative power but when once it has entered into the union it must remain there as part of the whole otherwise the states would be a mere league as in the revolutionary times mr calhoun had a right to bring the whole pressure of the slave states on a congressional vote on any question he could say as the irish members of parliament say unless you do this or that we will obstruct the wheels of government and thus compel the consideration of our grievances 
so long as we hold the balance of power between contending parties. But it's quite another thing for the Irish legislators to say, unless you do this or that, we will secede from the Union, which Ireland could not do without war and revolution. Mr. Calhoun, in his one-sidedness, entirely overlooked the fact that the discontented states could not secede without a terrible war, for if there is one sentiment dear to the American people, it is the preservation of the Union, and for it they will make any sacrifice. And the same may be said in reference to Calhoun's nullification doctrines. He would, if he could, have taken his state out of the Union, because he and the South did not like the tariff. He had the right, as a senator and Congress, to bring all the influence he could command to compel Congress to modify the tariff or abolish it altogether. And with this he ought to have been contented. With a solid South and a divided North, he could have compelled a favorable compromise or prevented any legislation at all. It is legitimate legislation for members of Congress to maintain their local and sectional interest at any cost, short of disunion. Only it may be neither wise nor patriotic, since men who are supposed to be statesmen would, by so doing, acknowledge themselves to be mere politicians, bound hand and foot in subjection to selfish constituents, and indifferent to the general good. Mr. Calhoun became blind to general interests in his zeal to perpetuate slavery, or advance whatever would be desirable to the South, indifferent to the rest of the country, and thus he was a mere partisan, narrow and local. What made him so powerful and popular at the South equally made him to be feared and distrusted at the North. He was a firebrand, infinitely more dangerous and incendiary than any abolitionist whom he denounced. Calhoun's congressional career was the opposite of that of Henry Clay, who was more patriotic and more of a statesman, for he always professed allegiance to the whole Union and did all he could to maintain it. His whole soul was devoted to tariffs and internal improvements, but he would yield important points to produce harmony and ward off dangers. Calhoun, with his state sovereignty doctrines, his partisanship, and his unscrupulous defiance of the Constitution, forfeited his place among great statesmen, and lost the esteem and confidence of a majority of his countrymen, except so far as his abilities and his unsullied private life entitled him to admiration. Authorities I know of no abler and more candid life of Calhoun than that of von Holst. Although deficient in incidents, it is no small contribution to American literature, apparently drawn from a careful study of the speeches of the great nullifier. If the author had had more material to work upon, he would probably have made a more popular work, such as Carl Schurz has written of Henry Clay, and Henry Cabot Lodge of Daniel Webster and Alexander Hamilton. In connection, read the biographies of Clay, Webster, and Jackson, see Wilson's History of the Rise and Fall of the Slave Power, also Benton's Thirty Years of Congressional History, and Calhoun's Speeches. End of section 14.